Hello, everyone. Ooh, that's really loud. All right, let's see if I can get that audio a little bit more balanced. Okay, I think that'll work. Hi, everyone. Happy Tuesday. I'm going to take this headset off and keep an eye on my audio levels. I have changed my setup quite a bit today so that we can do some VR flying. Um, so the flip side of that is I've added uh, maybe like five new moving parts and changed my audio setup uh, so I don't run into my microphone with my VR headset. So if you hear any uh, odd setup things or if anything isn't coming through very well, uh, do let me know and I'll try and fix it. Um, one thing I'll mention now while I'm thinking about it, that's kind of, because it's kind of relevant, is I will not be able to check the chat as frequently when we're actually flying in VR. Um, we'll do a couple of full stop taxi backs, at which point I'll go and check the chat, look for questions, we'll debrief on the last couple of laps, and then we'll go fly again. Um, but uh, yeah, but I'll do my best to juggle all the different pieces. Um, the real focus today is going to be on flying and talking about what I'm seeing and doing. Um, and then trying to take some pauses so we can do some good questions. And in a world where I can figure out how to do like, in the VR, I can see the Steam chat or, I'm uh, sorry, the Twitch chat or, or whatever else is going on. Um, maybe in some future world that'll all work. Uh, but if you have any suggestions for live stream tools you've seen for VR, Microsoft Flight Sim or other VR games in the past, uh, do let me know because I'm trying to figure out the right balance here that's still useful. All right, got off on a little bit of a sidebar there. Why don't we talk about, right, why don't I start at the top here? So, hi, happy Tuesday. This is a series of flights starting from uh, the beginning of the private pilot uh, syllabus all the way through passing the private pilot airman certification standards. So this is supposed to be a set of lessons that you would go through if you were actually going to learn to fly. I do want to put the disclaimer on it that although I am a real life CFI, the best way to learn to fly in the real world is to work with your own CFI one on one. Um, they'll be able to help coach you along, make sure that you're uh, improving in the areas that you're weakest in and also not spending a bunch of time on things that you're already performing really well at. And so if you are interested in learning to fly, and I hope you are, uh, my recommendation would be to look at your local airport and see if there's a flying club or a flight school or a CFI who works at the airport who might be able to go and do a demo flight with you. That'll be a chance just to take the controls, try out flying, see if you like it, and then you can decide how you'd like to do lessons from there. Uh, lessons do build on one another, uh, as you might expect, but I will be sensitive for folks just tuning in for periodic lessons here and there, so that hopefully you still get something useful out of this that'll improve either your real-world flying or your simulated flying. Some of the videos from past lessons on Twitch have now expired, so the archive is all up on YouTube. You can find a link in the, I believe it's the About page on my Twitch uh, home. So that's a good place to look for that if you are curious to see older lessons. If you have any questions as we're flying, feel free to post them in the Twitch chat. I will also, uh, after the fact, if you have anything come up, uh, there's a Discord that's a great uh, location for those. In fact, I will post both the YouTube and the Discord links. Anything else? The only other thing is um, the disclaimer I had emphasized early on in the stream is back in full force, which is that especially with a bunch of new moving pieces, there may be new bugs that uh, come up. So apologies for any of the bugs, and also do let me know if you notice anything that's um, making it hard to learn from the lesson. That's all I got. So if there aren't any questions here, I'm going to double check my audio levels again. Everything sounds OK. The background music is a little, a little loud, but that's all right. All right, let's get going. No questions, you sound great. Thanks, Shoots. Yeah, I took your suggestion about focusing on the flying aspect of this. I think audio is good. Could be a little louder without issues, but this is good. Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, we'll see as I get going. 
I'm also, I was watching some of the old videos and realizing that I have a habit of not enunciating through the end of sentences. I sort of, sometimes we'll just let them like taper off. And so I'll try to enunciate through the whole thing. Um, but uh, yeah, shoots, I took your suggestion to focus on the flying aspect and have the rest of it be um, like the, the main priority is showing what I'm doing and why I'm doing it in the plane. I think the VR setup is gonna work really well for that. Uh, but we'll see today. Well, uh, it's a little bit weird uh, looking through just the left eyepiece. So we'll, I'll, I'll appreciate your feedback as we get going. All right. So we have two topics today. And I actually, for those of you who have been uh, paying attention to the flow of the syllabus, may notice that this is a little different than even what I said yesterday I was going to do. So as I was going through this lesson plan to prep it, it became clear that in order to really have a a fruitful flying the traffic pattern lesson where we actually go out and fly. We also need to have an element of how do you do the landing portion. Um, we won't do full landings today. There's a little bit more of a discussion. We'll do a couple of full landings just because we want to get on the ground and talk about things. Um, but the focus today will actually be on go arounds. Um, so we'll talk about flying the traffic pattern and we'll talk about go arounds in one single lesson as opposed to splitting them up into two sort of smaller lessons. So oops, I'm going to do this. Our objective today, develop knowledge of towered airport traffic patterns, skill and judgment in approaching and departing various types of patterns, and good procedures while flying the pattern. Additionally, develop knowledge, risk assessment, or risk management, excuse me, and skills associated with go around or rejected landing, with emphasis on landing conditions that may require a go around. Specifically, we're going to talk about towered airport procedures, that is because where we are practicing at Palo Alto is a towered airport. And so the procedures that you as a student would be interacting with are all towered procedures. When we start to go cross country, when we start to look at other airports um, around the Bay Area that are non-towered, then we'll talk about the non-towered procedures. In some ways, they're very similar, same traffic pattern. Uh, they'll also have a specific altitude that you're supposed to fly at for the traffic pattern. There's a couple of things that are a little different, especially radio communications, um, but we'll talk about that in a future lesson. I think it's like lesson 12 or something like that. So just a little ways down the road. A couple of references that are useful, the Airplane Flying Handbook, chapter eight and chapter nine, the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Now, oh, I can say what these are. So this is airport traffic patterns and approaches and landings. Um, this also covers then go arounds and rejected landings. EHAC chapter 14, this is all about airport operations. The AIM chapter 4-3 is also all about airport operations. Um, this is a really good moment in training to start looking through the AIM and seeing what information is in there. Um, but also this is a really good chapter to read. So 4-3 um, will be really valuable, even if you're you know just kind of casually interested in getting better at flying. When I was first starting, I thought 4-3 was just fascinating to read because it's the kind of thing where you know, you, you read about things that then when you go fly commercially, you see them around the airport and you kind of do that. So obviously we interact with them uh, here or other places we fly in the sim. Um, but yeah, I don't know why I like the AIM 4-3 so much, but this is a, a favorite chapter of mine. And then of course the private pilot airman certification standards. This builds on towered airport operations and ground reference maneuvers. So earlier on we had talked about uh, radio communication and things like that with the tower. And then of course the ground reference maneuvers we did yesterday, that rectangular course where we're correcting for the wind with crab angles, all of that is gonna be the same sort of things that we do in the traffic pattern. So that uh, actually flying that rectangular course in the rest of training, we probably won't go out and do another one. As we're practicing for the check ride, we'll do S turns and turns around a point. Um, to get that kind of increasing, decreasing bank angle. Um, but you're going to be practicing the rectangular course every single time we go and fly the traffic pattern, which is at least once per flight. A couple CFI pieces of equipment. Um, so for a flight in the real world, I'd bring my GPS, my ADSB uh, transpond, or my ADSB um, Century, which will allow us to see the ground track of where we're flying. We'll actually use that today um, because we want to see that kind of nice, clean rectangle shape. Um, and then when we debrief, we can talk about uh, the shape that we're seeing and, and what that might tell us about um, 
the way we're flying the pattern. I have us booked for an hour on ground and 1.5 hours of flight. Because we're not doing that sort of instructor, demonstrate, student, uh, perform, and then work on back and forth, uh, we probably go a little bit faster. I do think we'll finish at about 1 o'clock, so a normal two-hour lesson. Uh, but in the real world, this would be a day where we kind of go up, maybe do three rounds around, um, land, talk about it, go up, three rounds around, go out, land, talk about it. Um, one of the classic mistakes of a new CFI is to just drill on landings or drill on traffic patterns. And um, they can be, especially for a new pilot starting out, um, really uh, mentally draining. And so I'll try to make sure that we're taking some breaks today. But also, if you are doing lessons with your CFI and you find that you're getting um, worn down from whatever the maneuver is or you just need a break, um, one of the things that I used to do that I'd recommend is you can ask your CFI to fly one lap around. One, it'll show you kind of what they're seeing. It'll give you a chance to cross-check the things that you're thinking about. It also gives you a chance to just take a break on the controls. Um, so that's kind of one way to refresh. Another thing to do is just maybe keep the lesson shorter is another way to, to handle that. All right, let's talk about our lesson elements. I don't know why this one is so big. Oh, that's why. Oops. <laughs> okay, that'll do it. Uh, okay, so our lesson elements, then we'll have completion standards, homework, and recommended homework uh, like usual. So two key parts of the lesson we're going to talk about today, traffic pattern and go-arounds. I've essentially structured them as the same lesson content structure we normally use, but to talk about traffic patterns first, go-arounds second. And then we're going to go up and fly them, and you'll see all of those come in to play. Um, because I'm going to do the VR setup, I'm going to have it be where we do more of like a ground session like we would do in the clubhouse maybe. Um, where we'll actually talk through the whole topic before we go out and fly. And then once we get up flying, I'm going to be flying the whole time uh, until we get on the ground to debrief. So um, that is a long-winded way of saying that we're going to spend a bit of time right now on the ground, whereas before we had sort of been pausing mid-flight and talking about these techniques. So all right, let's dive in. So traffic patterns first. Uh, four main areas we want to talk about here. The uh, entry procedures and pattern information and where you can find that. So if you're um, kind of a, a regulations or um, FAA publications nerd like I am, these are some pretty fun ones to go and look at. So we'll talk about those. General traffic patterns, um, how they work in the most generic sense, and then specifically towered airport traffic patterns. And we'll use Palo Alto where we're flying now as an example. The power, airspeed, and configuration we'll use for the Cessna 172 SP, the plane we're flying, and then a couple of common errors. For go-arounds, we're going to talk about situations that require a go-around and go-around procedures, and then a couple of common errors. So um, this one will take some practice, but the fundamentals are pretty straightforward. I will mention when we talk about landings, we'll also hit on some uh, what what you might hear called rejected landings, meaning either there's some reason why when you're coming into land, you don't want to land or, or think it would be better to go around. And so uh, although we're talking about the go around procedure today, when we talk about landings, that will also call back to a lot of the things we talked about with go arounds. All right, traffic patterns. So finding entry procedures and pattern information, there's a couple of places you can look for to learn what the traffic pattern of a specific airport is. And what I'm realizing is it is way better for us to talk about what a traffic pattern is before we talk about where to find that information. So I'm going to quickly move this up because there's no reason to wait on talking about this. Okay, so let's talk about a general traffic pattern. So a traffic pattern can be left traffic or right traffic. A left traffic traffic pattern means that you're making left turns. So if I open up this, you can see that this airplane is flying like this around that same sort of rectangular core shape that we saw with the ground reference maneuvers. And you can see that he's, uh, this aircraft is flying left turns. And so it's a left traffic pattern. 
Depending on the airport, it can be either a left traffic pattern or a right traffic pattern. Or, for instance, at Palo Alto, we primarily use a right traffic, I'm sorry, we primarily use a yeah, right traffic pattern, depending on the wind. Um, uh, actually, I'm not going to go into Palo Alto because it, it gets slightly more confusing than it's worth right now. Um, because the primary traffic pattern is the one that keeps us over the bay so that we're flying over the water. Um, whereas the primary traffic pattern, yeah, most places just have one way that you do the traffic pattern. Palo Alto happens to operate both, but they're a towered airport. So the traffic pattern itself is this rectangular course that essentially has you climbing out away on takeoff from the runway. And then you turn perpendicular on this crosswind leg and then you turn down on the downwind leg, and then you turn uh, again perpendicular to the runway on your base leg, and then finally you turn to parallel the runway to come into land on the final leg here. And then you would descend to land and land on your rear runway. The downwind leg is called downwind because when you land, you wanna be landing into the wind. Remember we talked about the effect of wind reducing our um, ground speed. So just like in takeoffs, when we had a headwind, we were able to take off with less runway. When we have a headwind, when we're landing, it means that we can land with uh, also using less runway. And so we almost always land into the wind. I'll be using the names of all of these legs as we're flying around today. I'm trying to call out as we turn onto each to start to build a mental map of them. Uh, but these are important ones to start to memorize because the tower will call things out like um, I'll call your crosswind or they'll say maybe extend your base to the amphitheater or they'll say um, traffic, you, the traffic to follow is on downwind. Um, and so you need to know what all of those different directions mean and what the different leg names are. Um, you'll get quite a bit of practice with this, but this is something worth memorizing or at least investing some time into to learning. Uh, so like I said, there's five named legs. So we can go back here. That's the departure, crosswind, downwind, base, final. Typically, they're left traffic, uh, meaning we're making left turns. You can have a right traffic pattern uh, that would be the same as this, except instead of taking a left turn here, the plane takes a right turn and kind of goes around like that. Uh, and I want to put a special emphasis on the word pattern. So. Oh, Seeing flying turds question here, let me give it a read. When you say it's a left-handed traffic pattern, the left refers to the side of the runway in your facing direction. Be your pattern. Flying turd, I'm reading your question. I'm not sure I quite follow. Uh, it, what it refers to is the direction you're turning when you come complete when you're doing the traffic pattern. So a left traffic pattern means that you're making left turns around the pattern. So if I pull this guy back up, we're making left turns through this whole thing. Does that answer the question? What do they base the direction off of? You mean like how do they decide if it should be a left traffic pattern or a right traffic pattern? Because if you land the other way, it'd be the right traffic. Yeah, so, right. So if you landed, if you instead made, uh, I think there's like maybe three really good questions in there and, and I'll try and answer all three. I'm not sure. Uh, let me know if I, if I hit on what you're asking about. So the default traffic pattern, if there were no mountains, there's no buildings, there's no obstructions, they're just, you know, a nice airport in the middle of nowhere. The default traffic pattern is always left traffic. So that would be what you'd expect unless there's an indication otherwise. And we'll talk about what indications there are and, and where to find those in about uh, 15 seconds here. Um, so, but the left traffic pattern is the default traffic pattern. Um, sometimes they'll use a right traffic pattern if there's maybe uh, an obstruction like a mountain or if there's buildings or in the case of Palo Alto, they prefer to stay over the bay regardless of which runway you're landing. Um, Yeah, I hope that's, I hope that answers it. Um, I feel like I maybe didn't quite get to what you're asking about, 
But yeah, if you... Okay, here we go. Uh, let me read this. That's right. That's right. Actually, yeah, that is that is a great, th that is exactly correct. So if you're doing left-handed traffic patterns at an airport, so let's go on the iPad. Actually, we can grab an airport sort of out uh, here. So let's say we go to, I want one that has it um, marked. Uh, let's just pick a random one. And this one may, I want just a single runway. Okay, so let's say that we're uh, flying at, yep, nope, totally, totally fine. And a really good question. Cause it sort of seems like, yeah, well, let, let me, let me see if I can answer this real quick for, uh, we'll talk about castles. So this is actually an enormous runway, but kind of a, a cool one to look at. So if we're departing runway three, one, so we're going off this direction, our standard traffic patterns are left traffic. And so departing there, we would go on the departure leg here turn crosswind, left turn, turn downwind, again, left turn, turn base, left turn, and then turn final, left turn. So if it were a standard left traffic pattern, that's what it would be. Let's say that we were then taking off on the uh, runway 1-3, so we're leaving the other direction, we're going like this. 1-3 may also be standard left traffic pattern, and so you turn left, and then you turn left onto base uh, to downwind, excuse me, and then you turn left onto base, and then you turn left onto final. And so you end up using, depending on how the airport is designed, you can end up doing, you know, uh, left turns. So, so in other words, if you're departing off of three one, you're doing left turns. You're departing off of one three, you're doing left turns. In both cases, you're doing left turns. But it depends on the airport design, and we're about to look at how you know which which one is which. Um, Palo Alto is sort of, sort of weird, but I can actually show you. So I did much of my training. I did most of my training in the Bay, but I did some of my training actually up in Hayward. And so Hayward is a really uh, good example of this because it doesn't have any, this is Hayward, Wisconsin. It doesn't have any big mountains around. There's nothing to kind of obstruct the traffic pattern. And so when we would depart from 2-1, it was left turns like this all the way around. But then when we would depart from zero three, it was also left turns. And so now we're using the other side of the runway, or essentially we're going to the west of the runway, um, like that. Thanks for the explanation, that makes sense. Was confused how they decide which is left and right since it could be changed and what, exactly, yep, yep. And so that's exactly right, yeah. So it's right and left is in relation to the direction that the aircraft is turning as it goes through the pattern. Nope, totally. Good question. Um, good question and a, a good point of confusion to, to make sure it's clear. So, okay. Let me clear this all off real quick. Oops. Okay, back to Palo Alto. Okay, so that's traffic patterns. Uh, and the named legs of the traffic pattern. So let's go and see how we figure out what direction the traffic pattern and, excuse me, altitude and any of the any other oddities of the traffic pattern there are. So there's a couple of really good resources for this. One is the sectionals. The next is the chart supplements, which you may hear called um, airport facility, uh, and I think it's airport facility directory. Um, this is an old acronym. The FAA prefers chart supplements, and the only place you see this anymore is ForeFlight, which is a little bit unfortunate because um, ForeFlight's usually kind of ahead of the curve on these things. But if you see that AF uh, slash D, that's what it means. It's the same as a chart supplement. You can also find the information in ForeFlight or if you're using some sort of electronic flight bag. And then the last place to, to check is the airport website. A lot of airports will actually have information about their traffic pattern. So we're going to look at all four of these uh, right now, and you can kind of get a sense for what information you might be able to glean from some of them. So let's start first with the sectionals. And I'm actually going to go back to Hayward because I think the map there is going to be a little less busy. So 
the sectional is this map with all the information about airspaces, uh, airports, and a bunch of other things. Um, we'll spend a little bit, or we'll spend a lot of time on it when we do our cross-country planning. For now, the nice thing to know is if you, uh, oh, and you can also go to, um, this is a good resource to shoots point. This is a good resource to have um, quickly available, but you can go to skyvector.com. Um, and ooh, let me post that too. So skyvector.com is a really good resource if you don't want to buy a sectional, but you do want to just kind of look at them. Um, this is a really good way to just kind of explore what they have. So there is skyvector.com. I um, highly recommend that. When I was first getting started, before I subscribed to Fourth Flight or anything, I would use Skyvector to get uh, basic planning information. Uh, so that's a really good one. So there's a couple of things that this tells me. Um, in the top left of the chart, so of the sectional, there's this whole explanation of what all the symbols mean. So when I'm looking at uh, Hayward and I see this info box that says it's Sawyer County Airport, HYR, uh, ASOS, which we'll talk a little bit about, but this would be the frequency that you use to get weather. This is the elevation of the airport in feet. The L means there's lighting, but the star means that there's some additional information. Either it's um, lighting that's pilot operated or something else going on. Five zero is the length of the longest runway in thousands of feet. I'm sorry, in hundreds of feet. So this is a 5,000 foot runway. And then this frequency with the C is the, oh, that probably is going to, Okay, that's fine. My VR headset just went to sleep, so I'll have to reset that, but that's okay. Um, but the frequency here with the C means that this is the CTAF. This is the radio frequency you'll use for communicating at the airport. So I know all of these off uh, just from memory because this is one of the best resources to learn how to use. Um, but if you were looking at it for the first time, you can go up to the corner here um, in the legend and actually look at what all the airport data is. And then this breaks down everything that you're seeing. So for instance, we looked at that L. So the L star here, limitations exist, refer to the supplement. The lighting limitations exist. So, um, okay, so that was a lot of information. The reason I wanted to show you that is that if we go, actually, let's look at this thing here. There's this line on here that says runways with right traffic patterns like this. So if you see on your airport, on the sectional for the airport, RP with a runway number, that means that when you're departing that runway, you're using right traffic patterns. If it doesn't say anything about the runway, it's left traffic patterns, right? Because left traffic patterns are the default. So if we go back, let me see if there's anything else on here to note. Uh, no, that should be fine. So let's go back to Palo Alto now. So Palo Alto is a towered airport. So the uh, color looks a little bit different. We'll talk more about that later. But you can see here's that same info box at Palo Alto. And so in this case, we have our uh, tower frequency, 118.6. The ATIS is our... Uh, in, uh, the weather information we get, so automatic terminal information services. And so that's when we tune in and get like, we have Bravo or we have Echo or whatever information about the weather. Again, the altitude in, or the elevation in feet of the airport, an L with no star. So at Palo Alto, the lights are always on, just at once it's sunset to sunrise, lights are always on. 2,400 foot runway. And the Unicom frequency is 122.95. I don't think I've ever seen this used in practice. Um, but when we talk about frequencies for non-towered airports, we'll talk more about what this is for. And then the last piece here, which is what we really care about, is this RP31. So this tells us it's right patterns for runway 31. So if we clear all this off, we know that runway 13, the departure goes off to this direction. And since 
runway 13 is not noted on the sectional, that means that it's left traffic and we should go like this. But for runway 31, it is right traffic. And so as we're leaving from 31, we're expecting to make right turns. And so the effect that that has in practice is that both the, the primary pattern for Palo Alto is to be flying over the bay side. So that's sort of how they how they write it on here is to say it's right, uh, right pattern 3-1. But the effect that they're looking for is they don't want you flying over the busy uh, downtown area here. If you can avoid it, they want you flying over the bay by default. We could grab another airport if we wanted to. So like, let's say we go out to, let's look at Livermore. So Livermore is a good example because it has two runways. So there's um, two, five, and seven. So two, five, uh, oops, let me see if I can label this. And I'm sure there's a way to, okay, okay. there we go. Yep, great. Okay, so this one tells us that it's right pattern. 7R and 25R. So 7R is runway 7, the magnetic heading that direction, and on the right side. So if you're departing from runway 07 right, they're expecting you to make right traffic. If you're departing from 07 left, it is not noted on here, and so that would mean you use the default, which is left traffic. So you're going to go like that. Okay. And if we look on the other direction, 25R, they're expecting right traffic. So we would go uh, to the right from 25R because it says it down here. Like that. And then we go to the uh, left from 25 left because it's not noted down here. And so the effect that that has is essentially that because they're two parallel runways, our traffic on the northern uh, runway is always staying to the north side and the traffic on the southern runway is always staying on the southern side. So there's a pretty nice reason why they have it coded that way, but the way you see it on the sectional is these two, RP7R and 25R. All right, so that's one of the areas we talked about sectionals. The other one is chart supplements. So let's go back to Palo Alto. So if we look at the Palo Alto airport in here, and you can search Palo Alto chart supplement and it would come up. Um, the way that I typically get to it is from for flight, you can go into the, um, oh, this is a slash FD. You can go into an under chart supplement that says a slash FD. And then this page gives you a bunch of information about the airport, more than we need to talk about today. One of the uh, homework assignments though is to go through and use the table of contents at the beginning of the chart supplement. So you can find it in ForeFlight, otherwise you can find it online. Um, it's just at the very beginning of the book and it explains each of these sections, sections one through, I think there's like 21 sections of information in here or something like that. Um, and that's really useful to do because this is your primary official source of information about the airport. So one thing to notice is we know on the sectional it shows us in shorthand, runway 31 is right pattern. If we go into the uh, chart supplement, sure enough, under runway 31, we also see that it's right traffic. So another source, we can kind of find that sort of information. It also gives us lots of information about like, for instance, the uh, glide slope, the uh, type of runway, the width and length, um, other noise abatement things. This is the other piece that I wanna talk about with the traffic pattern especially at Palo Alto. So in the chart supplement, it actually says there's a noise abatement procedure here. So we fly the pattern a little bit differently than just a standard square pattern for noise. What it says is that there's a noise sensitive area southeast through northwest of the airport. So southeast through northwest. Um, if you look at kind of a map of the area, you can see why that might be. So sort of around here, right? Everything over here. And so, their ask is to um, fly at or above 1,000 feet until crossing the Bayshore Freeway. So that's this Highway 101, if you're familiar with the area, but it's this big highway. So before we cross that highway, we're supposed to be, or as we cross the highway, we're supposed to be at 1,000 feet. And recommend departing, runway departing 
aircraft departing runway 31 turn 10 degrees right after takeoff until reaching the Dumbarton Auto Bridge. So we had actually looked at this before when we were first um, doing takeoffs, but as we leave 31 here, once we reach the end of the runway, we actually where the um, let me do this so we can see the um, oh they don't have it oh yeah they do okay so where normally we would just fly staying on runway heading at Palo Alto we actually deviate 10 degrees to the right and it takes us um, to a little building that's over here okay so that's the advantage of the Chart supplement, this is like an official source of all the airport information that's available, uh, including like hours of operation of the tower down here, the different frequencies you need, kind of everything. The next one I wanna talk about is ForeFlight itself. So if you are using ForeFlight, using electronic flight bag, likely they'll have some sort of uh, runway information. And so you can see on here, again, runway 31, uh, can't really draw on it, but in this section right here, it says 31 right traffic. And then if I look at the additional information, it'll tell us all about the uh, glide slope, uh, light uh, indicators available, uh, surface dimensions, all that sort of stuff. All right, last but not least, if you were to go into a airport that you've never been to before, especially airports in big cities, um, one example would be maybe you're planning a trip from the Bay Area to Las Vegas. So uh, you should do this for every airport you go to, see if they have a website with standard noise abatement procedures. You never know what you're gonna find. And sometimes the communities around are really sensitive to noise, so it's really good to check. Um, but especially if you're going to a big metropolitan area, you can kind of assume that there's gonna be some amount of specific procedures to that airport. Um, so let's say you're planning a flight from the Bay Area to Las Vegas and you want to go to North Las Vegas Airport. You could Google North Las Vegas Airport's website and they'll probably have either a noise abatement procedure page or a, a pilot information page or a procedures page. If you did that for Palo Alto, and I've actually saved mine in for flight as part of a content pack. So um, this is something that... Um, it's kind of a useful thing, but if you search San Francisco Bay Area content pack, it has a bunch of information for all the airports that you can include in ForeFlight. Um, but one of the things is the noise abatement procedure that you could also find online. So if I click on this, it'll actually show us exactly what we were just looking at. So again, it tells us down in the bottom right here, this noise sensitive areas west and south of the airport, maintain it above 1,500 before crossing US 101, that Bayshore Highway. Same thing we got out of the chart supplement, um, but just a different uh, visual presentation of that information. It has some information about the runway, frequencies, lighting, all that kind of stuff. Really, really usefully though, it shows us that same thing that we were seeing before. Oh, I totally left off a really important part on all of these. Okay, so one thing when we're looking at, sorry, I'm gonna skip back to all the different resources we have. So in this one, it does not tell us the altitude of the traffic pattern. So it just tells us which traffic direction, so right right pattern for runway 31. It tells us that information, but doesn't tell us the uh, traffic pattern altitude. In the AFD, it does tell us that. So if we look in here, um, it says the traffic pattern altitude, TPA, is 1,000 feet when you're flying to the west and 800 feet when you're flying to the east. We can also see that on the um, document we were just looking at. So if we go back to the noise abatement procedure, the one that you download online, it also tells us that the pattern altitude over the bay to the east is 800 feet and the pattern altitude um, to the west over the land is 1,000 feet. So this is a little unusual. Most airports, or, or I'm sorry, the standard traffic pattern altitude is 1,000 feet. So there's a couple unusual things. One is most airports don't operate both sides of the traffic pattern. That's pretty weird. Um, they do this because they're a towered airport with a lot of traffic. The other thing that's a little odd is that the pattern altitude is at 800 feet here. Um, so if we go back to our more kind of 
maybe standard and, and clean example. So we're back in Wisconsin on this one. So again, we have our standard left traffic for this direction and then our standard right, I'm sorry, our standard left traffic for that one and our standard left traffic for the other um, runway as well. Both of these two, you fly at a traffic pattern altitude of 1000 feet AGL. So real clean and simple. Uh, but when we go to Palo Alto, we actually fly, whenever we're flying over the bay side, we're flying at 800 feet AGL. And whenever we're flying over the um, inland side, then we're flying at 1,000 feet AGL. Feels a little confusing at first. That's OK. This is um, one of those quirks about the particular airport we're looking at. Fortunately, it's a really good example, I think, of some of the things that you would want to be looking for when you fly to a new airport for the first time. So this sort of information is really, really helpful. The other thing that uh, we know about is when we depart runway 31 off in this direction, we want to turn 10 degrees uh, for noise abatement. So that's them showing what that looks like and then kind of rounding around. One thing that's not on here that I did want to call out is the looking at my time. Yeah, I think I mean, this is all important stuff. So I'm going to uh, we'll spend a little bit of time still on it, but um, Yeah, okay, so, so this is the traffic pattern and it shows kind of how it works at Palo Alto. Another one that I wanna point out is just another airport and their um, noise abatement procedure. So this is San Carlos, it's just up the road. So we're at Palo Alto, over here is San Carlos. So really just down the way. And the noise abatement procedures for San Carlos include not only the standard traffic pattern altitude, so they, Describe what the traffic pattern altitude is, traffic pattern height of 800, and then this is right turns, a uh, right traffic from runway 30, left traffic from runway 12. They also have the departure and arrival procedure. So you see they have cement plant arrival, they have a KNBR arrival, which is a reference to the name of the radio tower, overhead arrival, uh, straight in arrival. They also have departures. So this is Hillsdale departure, Coyote Hills. And they're all named so that the tower can communicate to you how they expect you to enter or leave the traffic area. So this is another one of those things that when you're getting to the, or when you're researching the airport, you want to know what the typical departure and arrival procedures are. And uh, sometimes you want to know them for very specific reasons. In this case, for instance, we're dealing with the San Francisco class Bravo airspace. So you can't go into San Francisco's airspace uh, without specific approval. And so they have these procedures set up so that you can um, avoid going into the Bravo airspace. All right, so that was just to show that um, noise abatement procedures will sometimes have additional information like departure and arrival procedures. Uh, airport websites are another good source then for that procedures and pattern information. Let's look at Palo Alto specifically and some of the things that we'll be doing in our future flights. One way we talked about the pattern altitude is 800 feet on the east side. It's 1,000 feet on the west side. So let me go back to Palo Alto, set this up. The, oh, interesting. Yeah, there you go. So, and even in fourth flight, if I tap on this, it tells me that it's east is 800, west is 1,000. So if you are entering the pattern, so you're off in the distance and uh, maybe you're flying over near Slack, or maybe you're flying over, like yesterday, we were flying out near Livermore around this area. And so when you're entering the pattern, there's a couple of visual reporting points that you would use to tell the tower where you're entering from. So for instance, if we were flying over uh, Slack, that's the linear accelerator, and we can actually see why we might use Slack as a reference point. So it's this long, thin line here is really, really handy for uh, identifying because it's it's really clear where you are from the sky. So we might say something like Palo Alto Tower, Cessna Alpha Lima Tango Indy Sierra, 2,500 feet over slack inbound with echo, whatever the information is. And so then they would be able to go on their radar and say, okay, I know where slack is on my radar. I see some aircraft that's flying over here. Sure enough, that's the, the folks that just called in. And so then they'd give us some instruction like, you know, Enter on the 45 for left traffic, 3-1 might be a common instruction we get. So they would say, 
then we'd head over uh that's not my cleanest drawing ever oops uh, but that's okay so um, essentially they'll give us instructions on how to enter the traffic pattern including the direction of turns they're expecting so like we were seeing on here palo alto operates both uh, directions of pattern and so depending on where we're entering from they're probably going to have us do left or right traffic so coming from the west they're probably going to have us do left traffic coming from the east so let's say that we were flying in and if you remember we were doing our uh, rectangular course here so maybe we say palo alto tower snessa alpha lima tango india sierra 2000 feet over leslie salt inbound with echo and they would say something like enter downwind so that's that downwind leg, runway 31, uh, enter downwind, right traffic 31. And so then they'd, and so then we would know that means head to the downwind, turn onto the downwind leg, and then uh, do the rest of the pattern. Uh, if we were coming from maybe like uh, Coyote Hills is another common one. So these hills you can actually see when we hop in the sim, I can point them out. Um, but these are a pretty good reporting point. At that point, they might say, you know, um, enter on the 45 for right traffic 3-1. Yeah, and then that would essentially tell us from where you are now, enter some leg of the traffic pattern, maybe with additional entry instructions like enter on the 45, maybe just enter on the downwind leg. The last kind of one that you might get at a towered airport is let's say that we're coming in from, uh, Let's say that we are checking out Apple Park down here. And so we're going to fly in from Apple Park. Uh, there's some airspace considerations that would make this sort of unusual, but let's say we were doing that. And so we're heading in. They may say, you know, so we say Palo Alto Tower, Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra, 2,000 feet uh, over Apple Park inbound with uh, Bravo. And they would say Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra proceed straight in runway 31. And so a straight in landing would mean that we're just gonna line up with the center line and land straight. We're not gonna fly any of this rectangular business. We're just gonna land straight. Okay, I think that's all the ones that I wanted to talk about here. One thing again we talked about is if you are coming in from the west, right? So if we're flying over in the slack area, we wanna stay above 1,500 until we cross the freeway and then we'll descend. Um, this is a little bit of a, uh, you get different advice from different folks who fly in this area because there's a problem with waiting until you cross the highway to start to descend. And the problem is that you don't want to be descending when you're in the traffic pattern. So if we wait till we cross the highway, we've essentially made it to the traffic pattern and then we're starting to descend. If you're descending in the traffic pattern, you might be descending onto another airplane. The good news is that there's a tower, so they're watching out for you, but even still, you don't really want to be descending in the traffic pattern because let's say the tower misses something, you don't have visibility to who's below you. And if they're a high-wing plane, they might, have not, they might not have visibility to who's above them. Um, so the advice that I typically hear for this is when you're on departure, when you're using full power to climb, you don't want to cross 101 until you're at 1,500 because it's really noisy. When you're coming in, because you're going to be at low power because you're slowing down to land, then it's okay to cross 101 uh, at below 1,500 uh, is the advice that I have received in the past. Um, my expectation would be that... Uh, at least for the planes that we're using, you can cross at 1,500 and you would be able to descend because the pattern, I'm sorry, this is now incredibly messy, but the pattern actually looks more like, um, we'll fly it like this. And so like if you're coming in to land on the, or if you're coming in on the 45, you actually have from you know here until you're turning on to, um, to kind of get established to it. Yeah. I think what I'm saying is uh, the most important thing is to make sure that you're flying safely and you're uh, aware of the traffic that's around you and doing what you can to make yourself visible to that traffic. Um, 
while also being mindful of the noise abatement procedures of the airport, um, which are how we maintain good relationships with those local communities. So, okay, let me keep moving on. Yeah, typically we'll enter on the 45 downwind. So like I said, if you're coming from the west, typically they don't have you enter on the 45 downwind. Or if you're coming from the, I'm sorry, from the east or from the west. Ooh, that's a really wide pattern. I like that. Uh, typically you enter on that 45. Um, depends a little bit on the direction you're going and what the tower says. A couple ways to leave the pattern. And we'll practice all of these throughout the course of this series. Um, you can do a, well, let's go back to our airport. And we can actually look at what they say. Um, oh, I thought they had a thing on it. Uh, ah, sorry. I thought that they had a, a departures thing for Palo Alto. Uh, well, I can tell you these ones. And then also at the airport, it's actually printed on a sign. So, uh, but anyway, so one of them is a left Dumbarton departure. So this is the Dumbarton auto bridge, this thing here. And so a left Dumbarton departure means you're going to fly out, oops, except you wouldn't maintain runway heading. You're going to fly out at your 10 degree offset and then turn left. A right Dumbarton departure, same sort of thing, 10 degree offset, turn right on the Dumbarton bridge. A overhead 270 means you depart and then you do a 270 turn back over this way. Um, and those are kind of the most common departure procedures we would use. Because we're usually taking off 3 1. So, because uh, usually the wind in the bay blows that direction, unless it's stormy, in which case we're probably not BFR flying. So, anyway. Okay, so for actually flying the pattern, we talked about standard right traffic for runway 3 1. We're going to turn 10 degrees to the right after departure for noise abatement. And you want to memorize the power settings and airspeeds, and you want to use correct wind. And you want to use wind correction angle to crab into the wind, just like we did when we were doing the rectangular course. All right, last but not least, for our actual speeds we're going to actually use, and you'll hear me say these time and time and time again. Um, you can memorize them now if that's uh, useful to you. Otherwise, um, honestly, I would memorize them now. I think I have that as required homework. Um, the specifics of what you use will change a little bit as you get to the specifics of the weather for that day. But in general, oh, this is one of the things that I didn't emphasize. I said it, but I didn't say it. Um, emphasis on the word pattern. So we talk about the traffic pattern. And the reason that we talk about it as a pattern is we want to do the traffic. We want to fly the traffic pattern the same way every time. It makes sure that we're building proficiency at landing and that we're setting up for a stable approach to land so that every single time we land, it's smooth, clean, um, and non-eventful. And so we build up this muscle about flying the pattern so that we're really good at, um, at landing every, so basically so we can hit our landing every single time. The other reason we talk about it as a pattern is that it's what other aircraft expect you to do. So if you were flying into a non-towered airport and you flew something that wasn't the pattern, like you flew um, coming in at a weird angle to the runway, or if you did something else, it is dangerous for other people who are flying because it's unpredictable behavior. And so we talk about the pattern because every other pilot, yourself included, should be flying the pattern to make sure that everyone else knows where to expect um, people and what they're going to be doing. A really good example of this is if an airport uses right traffic on one side um, or for one runway, but left traffic for the other. So Palo Alto, um, actually when the tower is closed at night, right, we're gonna have folks using right traffic if the wind is four three one, and left traffic if it's four one three. So when we're flying at night, all of the traffic goes around the bay side. Let's say that somebody wasn't paying attention, didn't read the chart, didn't know the area, and was just doing standard left traffic out of 3-1. So they're flying on this side now at night. All of a sudden, you have everyone else who's flying expects you to be flying over the bay over here. And there's one odd guy over here who's flying the traffic pattern incorrectly. Then when you as a pilot are coming in to try and join the traffic pattern, you're suddenly 
uh, having a pilot might be crossing your path in a place that you're not expecting. So all that to say that it's dangerous to be deviating from the pattern um, uh, without cause, right? Like we want to be flying that same predictable pattern every time uh, for our own performance, but also then for the expectations of others. Okay, so that then goes back to this power, airspeed, and configuration. Because we're flying the same pattern every time, that means that we can uh, can and should nail our airspeeds and our uh, power settings every time. So with wind correction and maybe headwinds or gusty winds, we may have to adjust a little bit. Um, and we'll talk about that, especially with landing, uh, when we, uh, next lesson when we get to landing. But uh, in general, we use the same airspeeds and the same power settings every single time. So on the downwind leg, we'll use 2000 RPM, 90 knots. When we get a beam the threshold, and I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, actually, I can draw it on here, which is sort of nice. So we're flying, we're gonna do our normal takeoff. We turn 10 degrees to the right to fly over to this building here. Um, probably, actually what I'm gonna do is, we'll probably turn crosswind about here and then downwind about here. On this downwind leg, we're going to be using 2,000 RPM, 2,000 RPM, and 90 knots. When we get a beam, the numbers, so if I turn off this aeronautical thing, literally these, I'm sorry, not the numbers, a beam where we want to land. So we're going to target landing at the threshold here. When we get a beam that threshold, we are going to change our configuration to be 1,500 RPM and 80 knots. And that's going to let the airplane start to descend. So if you remember when we were doing our uh, climbs and descents to descend, we reduce power and that's going to let the nose come down. Uh, in this case, we will also put in 10 degrees of flaps and between the 1500 power change, the 80 knot target and the 10 degrees of flaps, uh, typically I find you don't have to change much more if you just reduce the power the nose, uh, reduce the power, put in the flaps, the nose kind of settles at about 80 knots, um, which is why I like that speed. And then as we, oops, uh, then we're finished the downwind leg here. As we turn to base, then we're going to keep it at 1500 uh, RPM. Our target airspeed is 70 knots, and we're going to use 20 degrees of flaps. So as we turn on to base, we'll bring the flaps down, and we're looking for 70 knots in the airspeed indicator. And then as we turn final, we're looking for, again, 1500 RPM, 65 knots, and 30 degrees, I'm sorry, uh, 40 degrees flaps, full flaps. And sorry, I don't think you can read that super well, but 40 degrees flaps. So everything that I have written in the uh, document up here, these things. So 90, 80, 70, 65, 1500 RPM. Anytime we're just flying around the pattern, it's 2000, but otherwise it's 1500 RPM to start descending. And then flaps 10 when we're a beam, 20 when we're on base, 40 on final. So one notch down, two notch down, three notch down, uh, one per segment along. A couple common errors, lack of planning ahead, staying ahead of the airplane. I mentioned this in an early lesson, but one of the lines I think is really nice is for aviation is the most important thing in aviation is the next two things. Or the two most important things in aviation are the next two things. So you always want to be thinking ahead to what is the next two things that I need to be doing, especially when you're flying in the pattern where it's a busy sort of mental load and there's a lot going on. Lack of situational awareness with our traffic and then improper radio usage for getting radio calls at non-towered airports. When we get to non-towered airports, we'll talk about this more. But especially with towered airports, you need to get uh, clearance to land, and so making sure that you're staying on the radio. Uh, as a first lesson with the student, uh, the instructor, depending on you know how everything's going, instructor will likely do the radio calls for you, so you can focus on just flying. Um, but as you get better at the traffic pattern, it becomes more automatic. Then you'll take on the radio as well. Um, I'll try to call all those different things out as we're flying. Um, I may, well, we'll see how it's going. If it seems like it's a lot of um, useless information coming in, then I probably won't call out radio calls, but they are, I think, I think they are good to be aware of, of what's going on. All right, so we're at noon. I do want to talk about go-arounds because um, we're going to do those and we're flying around the traffic pattern. 
Um, oops, they are not um, super, well, let, let, let's talk about them real quick because I think it's just a little bit to cover, but um, but then we can use them today when we go flying. I'm gonna turn aeronautical on. Okay, there we go. So first of all, situations requiring a go around. So a go around is when you're coming into land, but instead of landing for whatever reason, you apply power and continue flying and then take off. So um, there's a couple of reasons why you might want to do that. The top line item is you should be aware, uh, you should be ready to, for a go around at any time because you never know when an animal is going to run on the runway or a plane's going to take the runway or something else is going to happen. Um, and so every landing is a potential go around. And if you're not sure if you should go around, you should go around and you should probably go around uh, sooner. Don't let things develop and get out of hand. So as you're coming in for your approach, if it doesn't look stable, if you don't like the picture, go around and try it again. There's no, um, uh, how do I want to say this? The responsible decision, if things don't look good, is to go around um, and people on the ground as a new pilot, it sometimes feels like, oh, but people are going to be like, you know, oh, he had to go around three times to do the landing or whatever. And I will tell you what, every single pilot on the ground will applaud you for making the right uh, decision at the time when you're flying. Uh, no one's going to care that you went around. Everyone's going to care that you made good aeronautical decisions. A um, couple other reasons why you might go around too high when uh, you're too high to land in the first third of the runway. So if you're not going to land in the first third of the runway, you should go around. There's traffic on the runway, or if you get an instruction from the tower to go around, they might just say Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra, go around. If you're unstable on the final approach, unstable in this case, a stable approach would mean that you have your constant power and you're on a constant uh, glide angle descent down. So you shouldn't really need to be adjusting much to do that. An unstable approach would mean maybe you're applying a bunch of power or moving power, you're kind of moving up and down on the glide path. Um, Possibility of wake turbulence. We'll talk more about wake turbulence when we talk about landings, but this would be um, uh, the uh, essentially, well, we'll talk about wake turbulence tomorrow when we talk about landing, but the pos possibility of wake turbulence and wake turbulence is something that might exist if another aircraft just landed or another aircraft just departed. Um, and we'll get into the specifics tomorrow. Another reason you might go around is wind shear or a gusty crosswind. Again, we're going to get into more of that tomorrow when we talk about landings, but wind shear is a sudden change in wind speed, uh, either a vertical change or a horizontal change, and so that would destabilize your approach and would be a good reason to go around. Um, you might experience a lot of sudden uh, loss of lift or something like that. And the last one is a bounced landing or ballooning during flare. So if you come in to land and you land too hard, you bounce off the runway, or if you bounce and that increases your angle of attack and you start to climb up again, um, those are all good reasons to go around. You don't, you know, um, when in doubt, better to go around. Um, depending on the size of the bounce, sometimes you can resettle the aircraft. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that with landings. But in general, if you're not sure, going around is always a good option. All right, so what is going around in the 172? So let's look at this go around procedure so you can see. First part of the go around is a timely decision to make a go around. From there, you're going to apply max power, adjust pitch attitude, and allow airspeed to increase. So you're coming in to land like this aircraft, and you decide you're going to go around. Very first thing you do is throttle full forward and pitch to be level with the horizon to let the aircraft start to accelerate. After you get um, airspeed to VX, actually, do we use VX or VY? Yeah, so to VX, then you're going to start climbing. So you're going to pitch up for a climb attitude and, um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, full power, level the aircraft, and then you want to bring your flaps up one notch. And we'll talk about that. If you have full flaps in with the Cessna, uh, it's very uh, high drag, and so it's hard to accelerate. So we uh, full power flaps one notch. Um, so flaps to 20, and then accelerate to VY. Um, which is 62 in this aircraft. Climb, we're going to pitch to VY or VX to climb out. Uh, we'll use VY, our normal climb out. So essentially what you're doing is you're stopping the descent, accelerating out to your normal uh, rotation speed, your normal takeoff speed, 
pitching for that and then climbing out at that speed. So the rest of it is just a normal, sort of like you're taking off like normal. Uh, some aircraft you need to cool the engine for a takeoff like that. We don't have to do that in this airplane. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed one thing. In the climb, if there's another aircraft on the runway or you have a reason you want to be able to see the runway, you might want to deviate off the center line. Um, some instructors will tell you to always deviate off, devi deviate off the center line um, just to get out of the way of whatever's going on. How, whatever reason it is that you wanted to go around, they say the best habit is just to get over. Um, I'm of the opinion that if you're going to be that close to the ground, I'd rather you accelerate away over the runway unless there's a need to get over. So if there was an aircraft on the runway, definitely get over. But if you're just going around because an unstable approach or something else, I'd rather you be aligned with the runway to land if you needed to. Um, the next thing then is so after you start climbing, you're going to configure. So once you have a positive rate of climb, you're going to incrementally raise the flaps. You don't want to just flap flaps up all the way. You want to let the aircraft stabilize with each new flap setting um, so you don't suddenly change the aerodynamics of the airplane. And last thing, call. So you notice as much as C's. We'll talk about that in a second. The last thing is call. So you want to report the go around to the tower. There's a saying you'll hear called aviate, navigate, communicate. And what that means is that the most important thing when you're flying is to aviate. So if you're in an emergency situation, if there's a lot of things going on, number one priority is to aviate. Just fly the airplane. Everything else can wait. Just fly the airplane. Once you have the mental space to do something else, then the next thing to do is to navigate. So that's what direction are you going? Where should you be flying to? After you have the mental space freed up, you've successfully, you're successfully both aviating and navigating. The last thing you worry about is communicating. So in a go around, there's a lot of things happening at once. You want to get the airplane stabilized and flying. Once you've got the aviation down, you've got the navigation down, then finally worry about communicating. But it is an important thing to do. You eventually do want to tell the tower that you are going around. And last but not least, we'll use our takeoff checklist to make sure that we've done everything. So this is a good sort of flow to go through. Um, in IFR, in instrument flying, we call it the five C's. It's a nice kind of model. So cram, climb, cool, configure, call. So cram, you put the throttle full forward, flaps to 20, um, let it accelerate, and then you climb. So you're going to pitch up at the correct attitude for a VY climb as your VX or VY, but VY climb as you're climbing out. Cool, not something we do for the 172. Configure, so this is then getting your plane set up for normal traffic patterns, so incrementally raising flaps. And then last but not least, call. So five Cs, cram, climb, cool, configure, call. A couple common errors for the go around, initiating a go around too late. So as soon as you uh, are seeing that there's a reason to go around, it's a good time to initiate a go around. Too slow power application or leaving the car peat on. We don't have car peat in this plane, so it's not a concern. Um, but when you're applying power, you want to be um, smooth but rapid, right? So you shouldn't be slamming the throttle in, but you should be applying it quickly. Applying it quickly and smoothly. Improper pitch attitude causing uh, touchdown or porpoise. So if you're flying in, if you don't level off to the horizon before you accelerate, um, you can get a touchdown or a porpoising, which We'll talk about with landings. I actually don't remember seeing that in the lesson plan, but let me make sure I put that in there. Um, okay. Lack of rudder coordination to correct for P factor or torque. So if you remember when we are climbing, we get that additional P factor, the left turning tendency. So you got to use rudder to, to counteract that. Drifting from runway center line, unless you're offsetting for conflicting traffic. So we want to keep aligned with the center line unless we're offsetting, just like if we're doing a takeout or a takeoff, excuse me, takeout. And last but not least, forgetting checklist items. So flaps, car peat, cowl flaps. All right, so there's our traffic pattern. We will be departing on runway 3-1 today. And so we'll be doing 800 foot traffic pattern because we're on the east side over the bay. Uh, and we will plan to just fly the traffic pattern if there's time, maybe we'll leave and come back in so we can see. Um, but I'm going to give instructions as though we were hearing from the tower multiple different things that they might say to us while we're flying around the traffic pattern, um, just to give some examples of the kinds of instructions you might get. Important things we'll be focusing on is all of these correct air speeds and um, power settings and configuration around the pattern. 
making sure that we're getting that pattern feel to it, doing the same thing every time. And then we'll practice our go arounds. Um, so we won't do any actual landings. We'll come down and then as we get uh, closer to the ground, then we'll do a go around, practice that and take off again. All right. Any questions from the chat before I hop into VR here? And while I wait, I'm going to um, see if I can get this game to go. Okay, I think we're in good shape here. So I'm gonna flip over to VR and let's see, um, like I said, sort of apologies in advance for any uh, tricky pieces as I try to get the uh, VR like audio and everything going. So I'll try and peek up every now and then to make sure things are working, um, but uh, bear with me if, if things get a little wonky. Okay. It looks dark because I haven't started the flight yet. And I'm going to flip over to the map here so you can see where I'm flying and hopefully see the traffic pattern. And I'll just leave it zoomed out like this so that the pattern is visible all the time. Um, I think that's it. I'd like to use my checklist for the takeoff piece, which is going to be tricky in VR. Um, I'm sorry, my checklist for uh, startup. Make sure I don't miss anything. Uh, I think I can make it work. So while I'm doing this first bit, I may have a bit of um, back and forth from VR tilted up and things like that. But let's see how it goes here. Okay. Got my feet look good. Seat height's okay. This microphone is really far away. How's that for audio levels? Okay, seems okay. And get myself situated here. Okay, I have to be a little higher. There we go. Okay, great. And I can also talk about what I'm looking for in my seat position then, which is kind of nice. Get my mouse back here. Okay, so let's see how this goes. So one thing that I can point out here, um, that uh, seat height that I was hoping for earlier when we were practicing with the sim is just to see the top of the cowl here. So this is actually kind of exactly where I'd wanna be. It also means I can kind of duck my head out just a little bit to check under my wing, do the same on the left side. Um, so this is a pretty good height now for me here. Okay, let me do a quick sanity check that everything looks okay in there. Yeah, it seems like it's working. Um, well, give me any feedback if you have it. But uh, let's go flying. So, okay, so I'm gonna grab my iPad, start going through my checklist. So we've done the pre-flight inspection. That would have been what we did when we first got out to the plane before we got to this point of being in the plane. Passenger brief, so those are the brakes. Um, so passenger brief, we uh, there's a good checklist we can go through. Uh, we won't do that today, but it sort of covers everything a passenger should know. Seat belts, seats and seat belts we've done before. Uh, brakes, let's make sure our parking brake is on, which it is not. Okay, there's our parking brake. Circuit breakers, check in. So I'd run my finger over the circuits here. I'm looking for any that are popped out. They seem good. Electrical equipment off. I have my beacon on. The rest of the electrical equipment is off. Avionics master switch is off. Fuel selector valve is on both. The fuel shutoff valve is out though. So I'm trying to use my mouse to do all this controlling. I think it actually might work, but there we go. And then ATIS call. So I have the weather set to um, clear, uh, clear skies. And so that means that there's no wind. There is 29.92. 
uh, inches of mercury for our altimeter setting. So essentially we have like a perfect day for flying out, which is kind of nice. Um, otherwise we would call the ATIS like we normally do. And so we'll say that we, at the end of the ATIS, maybe they said we have information Foxtrot. Okay. Before starting the engine, throttle to one fourth. So bring it in a fourth of an inch. Mixture to idle cutoff. Master switch on. This is going, where's going to be trickier? Okay, there we go, good. Well, that's right, it's really bright in here. So I'm gonna actually turn down some of the light settings. Um, this one's gonna work. That's one, yeah, that's fine. Just don't need to be quite that bright. And then also above us actually, there's two more that I don't really like, they move on. Oh, wow. Hold my arm in a weird way. All right, mouse. Oop. Okay, there we go. So those are great for night flying. I think they're a little distracting during the day, especially because we really want to be looking outside of the plane anyway. Okay. Um, I'll throw the one fourth, make sure it'll cut off. Propeller area is clear. We'll call it right before we start the engine. Master switch on. Master is on. Flashing beacon is on. Flashing beacon is on. Auxiliary fuel pump on. Okay, so now we're gonna do our priming procedure. So this one I do need the most for. So I turn the fuel pump on and we should see our fuel flow start to go up. So I'm looking over the fuel flow. I'm increasing my mixture to full rich. And I need a little bit more throttle to actually get fuel flow to go. So we're still on zero. So I'm bringing in more throttle. That, oh, I didn't turn the fuel pump on. Okay, well, I don't know, there we go. Okay, so there we go. One, two, three, four. Okay, bring the mixture, turn the fuel pump off, make sure to idle, good. Our throttle should be in one fourth of an inch. Now we're gonna turn our ignition switch to start. And as soon as it catches, we'll bring our, uh, mixture uh, in. So I've got my hand on the ignition. So we'll call clear. Look around, make sure there's no one. Okay, good. Um, and then uh, bring the ignition to start. As it catches, bring the mixture in rich and uh, the ignition switch back to both then for my egos. Okay, good. Then we want to bring our power up to a thousand, check our oil pressure. So our oil pressure we've found in this game to be always a little low. Um, I would expect it to be in the green here, but um, but uh, for the sim, we're saying that that's just an artifact of the sim. Let's bring that back. I don't need it quite that high. Okay, great. And then mixture for taxi. Turn the avionics master on. Great, okay. And then we would bug in. There's the ground frequency and our tower frequency. Oops, I'm sorry, did that think in a, a different airport. Tower frequency of 118.6. Okay, great. And then we would also potentially put in our ATIS here. Um, we would have called already to get it, but it's nice to have it in our secondary just so we have it if we need it. Some of these uh, VR things work really well, some don't. Okay, there we go. And then we have that in our secondary. If we didn't want to use it, we would just put it on COM2 here. All right, next thing in our... How's this stream working? Okay, I'm gonna poke my head out and see what... Uh... What the messages in the chat are. Not sure if you're moving the VR away from your head when you're going through the checklist, but your audio is getting quiet from time to time. Hard to hear. Okay, great. Thank you.
Great. Thank you for the feedback, Flying Turd. Um, I think what's happening, so I'm using actually my um, overhead mic still, not the mic from the VR headset. And so as I look away, I think it, it kind of changes quite a bit. Um, let me know, as I'm looking down at my checklist, that's probably also not helping because I'm looking down and so I'd be blocking the audio. Uh, okay, then yeah, so that's probably it. Okay, how is the audio, well, let me try it with the headset on, but how is the audio like this? Does that seem like it's uh, pretty reasonable for flying around? And that'll be what it is more or less when I'm actually going. It's great now, yes, okay. Okay, great, sounds good. So thank you for the heads up, that is perfect feedback. Um, let's see if I can get back in uh, VR here. Okay. All right, great, so we're going. So we would say something like, there's the tower over there, so we'd say something like Palo Alto, Ground Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra. You can see the identifier there. Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra on we're on Romeo. Um, that would be something I could look at my iPad for, uh, but I just picked a random place. Romeo. Yep. Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra on Romeo with Foxtrot, right close traffic with the option. And so what I just asked him for is right close traffic with the option means I'd like to do right traffic pattern, which is what they would have wanted me to do probably from 3.1 anyway. Closed traffic means I'm just staying in the pattern. And with the option means I'd like the ability to either land or not land or do a touch and go. I kind of want to just have the runway space to myself or whatever I want. If I don't ask for that, they may only clear me to land. And so then they would expect me to land. Now, if you have to go around for something that comes up, you can always go around in the interest of safety, um, but they're planning around you landing for other planes coming in. So that's why it matters. Okay, so then the tower or the grounds could respond something like Cessna Alpha Lima Tango and Dia Sierra, taxi, uh, Yankee side, Yankee terminal side, Yankee one, Zulu to runway three one, advise runoff complete. I'd say runway three one via Yankee terminal side, Yankee one, Zulu. Um, will advise if I wanted to. I could say will advise. Okay, and then we start taxiing. So I'm gonna remove my parking brake. And looking for traffic around before I pull out here. Okay, good. And I'm just using enough power to actually start taxiing. And then I want to test my brakes. Uh, we're going to slice right through this guy. Sorry, bud. Uh, but uh, obviously, we wouldn't taxi if there was a dude just right there. OK, so my brakes work just fine. The instructor may want to test their brakes. And trying to keep the yellow line under my right foot is kind of the rule of thumb. Now, we've been doing a lot of, oops, uh, doing a lot of wind correction because uh, we've had some windy days these last few days um, right now it's totally calm so we don't need any wind correction which is kind of nice looking for traffic to our right and left make sure there's no one coming down here want to keep on this yellow line okay there's our yankee terminal side turn that he told us to do All right, so next thing we do is do our run-up. I'm gonna skip the run-up in the interest of time. Um, we've done a couple of those to kind of walk through it. You wanna do a run-up before every flight because the run-up allows you to test all of the systems and make sure everything works as you expect. Um, we have a luxury in the sim of knowing that the airplane is brand new. I think it's about like, what, 0.6 hours, which actually would be even more reason to do a run-up in the real world. A, a brand new airplane, you wanna make sure nothing weird is going on with it. Um, or an airplane right back from Maintenance is another really good one. You definitely want to be doing a thorough run-up on. Um, but uh, you want to do a run-up every time because you want to see what's wrong before you get in the air. Uh, for the sim, we know everything's working great, and so I'm going to just continue through. 
So we'd say something like Palo Alto Ground, Cessna Alpha Lima Tango, India Sierra, run up complete. They'd say Cessna Alpha Lima Tango, India Sierra, taxi, hold short, runway, or I'm sorry, taxi, up to hold short, Yankee One, contact tower. Looking for traffic, make sure there's no one gonna merge with us. We say taxi up to hold short, Yankee One, contact tower. So now we're coming up to Yankee One here. And so we would say something like, okay, so I'm gonna stop. We could stop a little closer if we wanted, but this is okay. We'll say um, every time we stop, we wanna bring our power to 1000 RPM. We're switching over to tower frequency. We say Palo Alto Tower, Cessna Alpha Lima, Tango India Sierra, short of Yankee One, ready for departure. I'll say something like Cessna Alpha Lima, Tango India Sierra, um, taxi up to hold short runway 31. We'd say taxi up to hold short 31 Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra. So what he just told us to do is we can taxi up to 31 to the start of the runway 31, but we want to sh hold short of those hold short markings. So getting going here, I'm looking for traffic. Make sure there's no one coming down Zulu to the left there. Good. No one to the right. It's kind of nice when we have the whole runway to ourselves. Okay. And so... You don't want to cross those hold bars until you're given permission, so we'll stay here and we'll say, and then we're just waiting. Um, traffic or the tower already knows what we want, and they're going to give us. Oops! As soon as we stop, we want to bring this up to a thousand. Traffic or tower already knows what we want, and so um, there's no need. There's no need to remind them. Um, I mean, they're seeing us waiting on the taxiway, so they'll they'll give us a call. Um, they may give us little updates like three people landing ahead of you, or we have an IFR traffic or something like that, but. I'm going to check uh, chat real quick, make sure there's no other questions. Otherwise, we're going to go up. I'll do um, probably three laps and then come back down and check chat again for any questions. No problem. Thanks. OK, great. Good. Glad to hear it. Sounds like audio is working OK. Let's go up and fly. So again, two things we're working on, traffic patterns and go around. So. They'd say something like Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra, runway 31, clear for takeoff. Um, one thing that I would have done in the run up, which I am going to recommend, is set our heading indicator to 31. So that's our runway uh, that we're going to be using, and we'll use that to verify that we're on the right runway. Um, and also, then when we try and stay aligned with the, tech, with the runway center line on departure, of course, we're deviating 10 degrees to the right for noise abatement, so we'll be off 10 degrees from that, but still a good setting to have. Okay, so he'll say something like, Cessna Alpha Lima Tango is here, clear for takeoff, runway 31, close traffic with the option, or right close traffic. Probably just say right close traffic. And then we'll say back, clear for takeoff, 31, right close traffic, Cessna Alpha Lima Tango at India Sierra. So before we start rolling then, we're gonna do lights, camera, action, so lights, Put those on. Oh, I would have had um, all but the landing light on already for the taxi. Uh, lights, camera is our ADSB, which is actually not on. Another thing that would have been caught in our run up. Here I am saying that we don't need to do the run up in the sim. So I need to set this to altitude reporting mode. The last setting, 1200 is VFR. That's good. Okay. Uh, so that's lights are on camera is they can see us on uh, transponder and then action so we want to set our um, uh, trim for takeoff mixture rich and flaps to 10 degrees which they are so we are ready to go lights camera action time last thing we do is look at the time um, you can see it on the clock there is is that right 828 oh yeah it is there you go cool okay so um uses Zulu time, but that's actually super useful for me for our lesson. So lights, camera, action, time. Let's go flying. Now, as I'm coming in here, I'm still holding the yellow line, but Approaching I'm also three one. I want to make sure that there's no traffic in the traffic pattern. Uh, remember at Palo Alto, they can land both left traffic and right traffic. And then I'm looking in here to see if there's any traffic in the downwind that I should be aware of. Maybe anyone in the upwind, make sure there's no one on the runway already. Okay. And remember, this is a displaced threshold, 
And so we start our takeoff from the start of the threshold here. No wind, so we don't need to use our wind correction as we go. One, bringing in power over four seconds. Two, three, four, so I have full power in. Using right rudder to stay aligned with the center line. And waiting, air speed's alive, good. 70% before we got to halfway, good. And at 55, we'll rotate, 55, rotate the nose. And then we pitch for our VY. We wanna stay aligned with the center line, so there is VY of 74, good. We've crossed the end of the runway, so I'm gonna deviate 10 degrees to the right. And at 200 feet, I will bring my flaps to zero. There's 200 feet, flaps to zero. Looking at my slip skid indicator, so I got the ball is centered. A little bit of right rudder, there we go. And I'm trimming out control pressure on the uh, trim wheel there. It's a little bit too much. Okay, now I'm also looking for traffic in the pattern. This is uh, an area where you're most likely to encounter uh, other aircraft because there's so much going on around the traffic pattern. Um, about 600 feet is okay to start turning for our right crosswind. Again, every time we turn, we want to look under our wing for traffic. Turn to the right. Well, we got a curious pup here. All right, 800 feet. Oops, overshot that a little bit. At 800, or 50 before 800, right, we want to level up a little bit, bring it to 2,000. There's our crosswind leg, and we're going to turn a downwind here. So 2,000 RPM, holding 800 feet. And looking at the runway, still looking for traffic as we're flying around. We want to make sure that we don't have anyone screaming into downwind here, especially if you remember, often we'll enter on the 45. So a likely place someone would show up is right there. Okay, pretty good. Get back to, all right, so. Now I want to make sure I'm paralleling the runway. So there's one thing I uh, can do is just looking out and you get a good judgment on it. You get better at judging that over time. Uh, I'm also cross-checking on the heading indicator, make sure that it shows that we are uh, seeing one three as our heading, which we are. Looking good, 800 feet. We'll do a gums check on downwind. We'll talk more about gums check when we do our landing, but essentially we're looking for our pre-landing checklist. So check our gas, good, we got enough gas left. Undercarriage is welded, and then I'm actually gonna tap my brakes and you should feel a little bit of pressure from the brakes. Undercarriage, mixture rich, so our mixture is rich. Um, uh, P for prop, it's a fixed prop, so we're good. And then seatbelts and switches. So we have all of our landing lights are still on. Uh, seatbelts are on. Oops, I missed my uh, threshold. So as I cross the threshold, I wanna bring 10 knots of flaps, or 10 degrees of flaps, and bring the um, RPM to 1500, and I want to see the nose drop down to accelerate to 80. Looking over my shoulder, the rule of thumb is when you're at 45 degrees to the runway, you can start your base turn, so that's about here. So we'll turn base now. As we turn base, pitch the nose up slightly, still on 1500 RPM, uh, but we're looking for 70 knots, and we put in 20 degrees of flaps. So there's 70 knots. Uh, as we're turning onto our base, and especially along the base leg, we want to be looking for other conflicting traffic, so I'm doing a lot of that. Airspeed's getting a little low. You might remember from our um, slow flight, we use pitch for airspeed, power for altitude. So I'm pitching the nose down to get back to 70. I'm a little low on glide path. I can tell that just from uh, experience in practicing on this one, but we'll also see the glide slope indicator in just a second here. So I'm putting a little bit more power. You can see I'm at like, I'm gonna use 1800 just to kind of maintain altitude here. Turning on to base, again, looking for traffic over our shoulder, make sure there's no one else coming on. As we turn onto final, we go full flaps, looking for 65 on our airspeed, and a little slow. So again, Short pitch final, for airspeed, power for altitude. One. So I'm pushing my, or not pushing, but yeah. Applying forward pressure is a better way to think of it, a little bit just to keep my airspeed at 65. Trim for that. Now I see two red indicators on the left side of the runway. Those are our glide slope indicators. We should see one red, one white. So that means I'm a little low for my glide path. So I'm gonna hold my altitude here with using a little bit more power, right? So there we go. And then back to 1500. Glide down, one white, one red, looking good. A little low on glide path. As we get to the threshold, it's all right to be a little bit low. Oops, 
air speeds decaying, so I'm going to pitch the nose down. Now, this is one of those things that's a little bit uh, wonky. We'll talk about that in a second, but you actually have to pitch the nose to the ground. All right. And we're going to do go around. So to go around, we go full power, flaps 20 immediately, and then we just hold level as we accelerate at uh, VY. We'll start our rotate out and positive rate of climb. So we're going to bring in 10 degrees of flaps, and then we climb out at VY. Once we get to 200 feet, same sort of thing as we would normally do. Uh, we'll bring in full flaps, still climbing at VY. So we did our cram, climb, cool, configure, and now we should call Palo Alto Tower, Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra, going around. Uh, and then we essentially go back and do the same thing again. So uh, we want to be 10 degrees off of our runway heading, so we're going over to here. And I'm climbing a little high airspeed. I should be angled up just a bit more. Okay, good. This is an okay time. So I usually like to turn around. This guy here is a pretty good if there's no conflicting traffic. So as we get to 800 uh, feet AGL, bringing the nose to level with the horizon, setting the uh, throttle to 2000. Again, always looking for traffic as we're turning through. Okay, good. And there's our crosswind leg. We'll turn downwind here. Okay, looking at the runway. Looking for traffic. Oops, sorry, I think I hit my mic. Okay, and rolling out on the runway heading. Okay. Good. So 2,000 RPM. We're at 800 feet a, uh, uh, altimeter, which is good. So that's our pattern altitude for left traffic. Um, and one thing that's really good to get in the habit of is picking a reference point at your uh, your home airport, wherever you're flying most frequently, that you can use for when you're pointed downwind. So downwind, I have this building out in front of me that I use. It shows up really wonky in the sim right now, and I, I don't really know why. Um, but it's sort of I'm sort of pointed at it right now, just to the right of this um, off the field runway. All right, so gumps check, gas, good, undercarriage welded, and brakes, mixture rich, props, switches, all good to go. As I cross the threshold, I'm bringing in 10 knots of flaps and bringing my power back to 1500. Let the nose start to drop. And I want to or I want to um, be uh, descending at about 80 knots. Okay, good. And I'm looking over my shoulder when I get to about a 45 with the runway. This is good, so we'll turn right here. And now we want 70 on base. Again, looking for traffic. Want to make sure there's no one coming around, either in right traffic or um, just doing something odd. 20 degrees of flaps. Again, looking for 70 knots. Okay turn a little bit steeper here because I want to have a nice base leg. So I want to have a nice square base leg here. A little slow. I want 70 knots of my airspeed, so I'm applying forward pressure to get the nose to 70. Make sure it's all trimmed up. Plane should fly itself. Good. A little high on the RPM. Bring it back to 1500. And now we'll turn on to base. Looking for 65 airspeed. Full flaps. Still 1500 on the RPM. We have our white over red, good. So that means that we are on our correct glide path. Our airspeed is getting a little slow. I want to be at 65, so I'm gonna nose down. Good, okay, now we have red over red, so I'm applying just a little bit more power to bring the glide slope back up. And let's get to white over white. There we go, or white over red, excuse me, good. Airspeed's a little slow. I want to bring the nose. Okay, so this I would consider an unstabilized descent because I sort of was going up and down through that whole thing. So we're going to go around. First thing, full power, flaps to 20, accelerate to VY, just holding over the runway, climb out at VY, aligned with center line, and then once we get positive rate of climb, go to 10. And once we're at, oh, I need a little bit of right rudder, count for P factor, and flaps as we reach the end of the runway then I'm deviating 10 degrees to the right and climbing out at the Y okay again looking for traffic in the pattern 
Okay, so let's say that we're climbing out like this and tower says something like Cessna, oh, and, and then uh, cram, climb, cool, configure, call. So the last thing we would do is call Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra going around. They'd probably say, they might say something like Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra, make left traffic, um, left close traffic. And, uh, or maybe they'll say continue to uh, you know, fly to the Dumbarton Bridge and then left close traffic. So uh, Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra to the Dumbarton Bridge, then left close traffic. We know that left closed traffic, the inland for Palo Alto uses a thousand. So I'm climbing up to a thousand here. And then once I get to a thousand, same sort of thing. I'm, I want my throttle to 2000 RPM. And we'll turn left at the Dumbarton Bridge. First thing we do is look under our wing for traffic. Roll in to the left with a little bit of left rudder. Good. Okay, a little bit too much left rudder. Good, looking for traffic in the direction I'm turning. Make sure there's no one around there. Power looks good. We have a little bit of a descent rate going on here. Okay, so now turning onto my crosswind leg. Uh, overturn just a little bit. I think that I have the track showing on the iPad, so we'll, we'll review those later. Okay, and now we'll turn onto downwind again. Looking in the direction that I'm going, make sure there's no traffic. Also checking my other quadrants, just make sure there's no one screaming along behind me. We're on the inland side, so our traffic pattern altitude's a thousand feet. Okay, good. And 2000 RPM still, thousand feet. Our airspeed's a little slow. I would expect it to be at more like uh, well, actually, it's kind of coming to 90 knots, so there we go. All right. Um, we'll fly. You know what I'm going to do, actually, is I'm going to turn off to the right a little bit here because I want to get a little bit more distance to the runway um, because I want to be about a half mile. Um, I want to be a quarter mile to a half mile away from the runway. A little bit more of a base leg, I find, is really, really helpful for a clean pattern. Um, and so I'm just going to turn over here. OK, great. And so looking for traffic around, do my gums check on downwind. Gas is good, undercarriage welded, mixture is rich, prop is fixed, and um, switches good, seatbelts are on. OK, good. As we come up to this threshold, so I'm looking for the runway to be about, I don't think I'm quite parallel to the runway. There we go. Runway to be about halfway up my strut there, so it's OK. As we come across the threshold here, so we are now abeam the threshold. Power comes back to 1500, nose is going to start to drop, and 10 degrees of flaps. And I'm looking to be descending here at 80, look at that, so we got 80 right there. And I will say that I didn't change any of my trim, so I was trimmed up to fly, I just set the power to 1500, put in 10 degrees of flaps, and that got us to that airspeed uh, pretty nicely. Maybe a little bit of tune up here. Again, looking for traffic, we get to about 45 degrees to the runway. Right about here is probably good. Then we're going to take our turn onto base. And so now I'm looking for 70 knots. And as we turn base, we can bring our flaps down to 20. There's 70 knots. Again, looking for traffic, especially on traffic coming in on like a long um, straight in. Someone just kind of screaming along here. And I want to be perpendicular to the runway, so I'm also keeping track of my ground reference. Okay. There we go. So there's my base leg and now we can roll into turn to final as we're going final we want 65 knots full flaps still 6 1500 rpm all right i overshot final a little bit there notice that i'm not jamming the nose over oh i am actually kind of jamming the nose over um, so we want to stay coordinated through that flying so my ball should be centered through all of that um, if i do need to come back a little bit of correction to get back aligned with center line is fine if you're really far off you might want to consider a go around um, we're showing a little low on the um, uh, uh, glide slope indicator. I don't actually believe those because I think the site picture that I would expect for this airport is a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit high for where we are. But uh, anyway, so we're at 61 knots. I want to get to 65, push the nose down a little bit. And I'm going to come in and do a full stop landing here so we can talk about it. So I'm looking for that place that I'm aiming for growing in the windshield. We'll talk more about that with landings. As I get into ground effect, bringing power to idle, leveling off, holding the nose off, off, and I just want to be flying the plane just above the runway, 
until it eventually just settles itself down. And then I come back to the center line and uh, we can get on the brakes here. And a, a, air, a physical aircraft, um, you don't really want to jam on the brakes uh, quite like I just did to slow down. I mean, if you need to in an emergency, obviously. I'm looking through traffic down the taxiway. Okay, and get ourselves aligned with the center line. We can stop when we're clear of the um, uh, the taxiway off, so someone can get in behind us. Power to 1,000, and we'll do our cleanup flow. So our cleanup is set our trim, and then we go up, set our power to 1,000. Mixture should be set for taxi. Flaps to uh, 10 for takeoff, and then our lights, and we don't need our landing light, but we'll use the other lights for... Uh, taxiing around. Okay, and then we'd run our finger over the checklist and look to make sure we didn't miss anything, um, which I can't do in VR, but hopefully I didn't miss anything. Um, and I'm going to put on the parking brake here and grab the iPad and check the chat real quick and see how audio and everything's going. So VR headset is going. I'll just leave it up like this. All right. Okay, no, audio is good, good, glad to hear it. Okay, so then let's talk about the traffic pattern that we just flew. So we did two different traffic patterns and actually I can go in and look at them from another perspective. So we'll do two different kind of perspectives on it. Um, so in both cases we were taking off on three one. So we did two right traffic patterns. We did one left traffic pattern. There's a couple of things I really like about this um what i'm seeing from my flying one is that when i got to the runway threshold a little bit after but for the most part i'm correctly deviating that 10 degrees off um, this is not what a traffic pattern should look like at most airports but at palo alto you want to deviate 10 degrees off and so that you know, normally you want this nice square but palo alto you want a little bit of deviation um, next thing that i like is it's consistent however i'm a little far from the runway so 4,500 when I was on the east side. Um, that's nice because it lets me get these nice, um, clean 90 degree base legs, which we're looking for. Um, but we really want to be about a half mile. Um, well, let me see actually. Now that I'm saying that, let me let me double check a reference because that's what we want for the ground reference maneuver. But um, I may be misremembering that for... to go and look at this later I think I know that it's in the um, there's a couple of references that talk about the right spacing from the runway um, and I worry I'm confusing that with the um, ground reference maneuver we did yesterday which would be uh, not great let me see actually if I can we can do this um, as a quick uh, exercise as maybe useful. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the aim actually, which I can find uh, in here. And so if I go into the, uh, nope, it's not in the Federal Aviation Regulations. It's in handbooks, aeronautical information, aim, and here we go. Traffic patterns. This is all the stuff we talked about today. Again, the aim, this chapter of the aim is great. So give that a look. Mm. Okay, well, I will um, take this as a note to go and confirm on that. Um, I know there's other resources from the FAA that have a little bit more specific suggestions on those. Um, I thought I could find that faster. 
Um, that's all right. So I will take a note and get back to you all on that. All right, good, glad to hear it shoots. Okay, um, so we'll keep looking at this. So the other thing that I like, the corners here are pretty clean. Um, the distance where I turned onto final was a little bit different. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Again, with the pattern, we wanna be doing it consistently and we should get consistent performance. Um, but, uh, but that's not in and of itself a problem. Um, the left traffic pattern was a little weird. So this is sort of what I would expect this 45 degree, but then I would expect this to be a cleaner 90. Um, I kind of followed the road intentionally, but really, you know, it's fly to the bridge, but then it should be a clean 90. Um, you can see where I came back out here is fine. This distance looks pretty good. And I would guess that that's, yes, yeah, so that's about that half mile. That That's sort of what I would expect. I know some people say to fly along 101 here to use this as a reference, um, gives you a nice long base. Um, so that's something else to consider. And disadvantage here is that I didn't have much time on base and so I couldn't really get a nice clean turn. So I'm going to guess actually I should have been further out. Um, but otherwise this seems okay. The other thing I'll show you because it's kind of cool is I made a little recording while we were flying and so I can actually take that uh, track log and we can look at this in 3D. And so we can say okay so you know what was our climb profile uh, on the departure leg here. We can actually play through it see ourselves flying around we can see our descent profile um, and if you load it into like a, a google earth or something you can see even more details on it so some kind of fun tools to play with all right back to here um, we have about eight minutes left um, let me do yeah yeah, shoots. That's the same thing that I was was seeing. Is like, I like the shape of the first pattern more. This, the one on the the bay side, um, but it feels like it was too wide. Um, but I'm gonna go and and see. The other thing to keep in mind is that the one on the bay side is at 800 feet AGL, and so it's sort of like I have less altitude to work with in the descent, um, whereas the one on the inland side is 1,000 feet AGL, and so you have a little bit more altitude to work with. Um, so I don't expect the the shape of them to be exactly the same because our we don't want to be like screaming down on the descent, so we'll need a little bit more time to do it. Um, but it, it surprises me that it's further out on the base side than on the inland side. So anyway, this is a great debriefing sort of thing because you can go after the fact and say, okay, so what was it that I was using for reference points that got me to that? Um, and what do I want to change for the next time I fly? Um, anything else that we should do? There's a couple of other things that the tower might tell us to do. Um, but I don't think we need to confuse it for today. We did a couple of go arounds, which was good. Uh, I did a couple of takeoffs. And tomorrow we're going to be practicing landings, which also means that we're going to be practicing uh, the full pattern. And um, since there's always the potential for a go around, we'll throw in a couple of go arounds, I'm sure. Um, so, yeah, why don't we call it there for today? Um, I will switch over to here. Let's see if I can do like that. Oh, look at that. Okay. Put my VR up. Um, for folks in the chat, did the VR work pretty well? Was that useful to see kind of what I was looking at? And was the, I don't know if the left eye, right eye seemed problematic or if everything seemed pretty good there? Yeah. Okay, shoot. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. That was intentional. Um, and yeah, because uh, and you'll see me. This is something I was getting frustrated with when I was doing it not in VR, which is you'll see me frequently looking out my left and right windows, and I'm checking for traffic, but I'm also checking my um, angle of attack relative to the horizon, so my pitch relative to the horizon, as well as my um, 
sight picture for level flight out to the horizon. So like I'm cross-checking my instruments um, to make sure that everything matches what I'm seeing. But a lot of the time, I mean, 90% of the time, right, I'm looking out that window and seeing what is actually going on relative to the rest of the world. Yeah, the frequency is, yep, good, good, I'm glad, yep. And a little bit of that's, um, you know, situational, uh, personal preference stuff. You want to be scanning for traffic all the time when you're flying because our responsibility is to see and avoid. We'll actually talk about this a lot with landing, but we're responsible as VFR or IFR pilots to see and avoid other traffic. And so you're constantly looking around to see who you can see. And that's part of the reason that we make ourselves visible with our lights. Um, but uh, especially around traffic patterns uh, and especially around busy airports like Palo Alto, you're constantly looking for traffic that might be coming in in a weird way, or maybe people are transitioning. So one of the other things that I didn't mention, but like we flew a left traffic pattern to 3-1. We're flying along that 101 highway, but folks are often flying the other direction along 101. And so then you have to you know, be aware for people coming at you as well as people also in the pattern. Um, yeah, so I'm glad that was really helpful. Um, yeah, I, I definitely liked it more. Uh, flying in VR feels much more realistic in my mind. Like you kind of, you can kind of sense where you are relative to the horizon in a way that you just can't otherwise. Um, I wish I could hear the engine still. I, just the way it's set up, I can't hear the engine at the same time. Um, and that's one of those things uh, I'm sure at some point we'll be flying around the pattern and I will just have the engine at full blast while I'm you know, turning into crosswind or something because you immediately in the plane, you'd say, wait a minute, I'm level and I have the engine all the way up. Something feels wrong and you could identify it. Um, but without the audio, it's a little weird. So staring at a single point for more than a second or two, you didn't become fixed on any one target. Yep, that's right. That's right, shoots. Yeah. And that's the other thing. When I had that like kind of weird zoomed out perspective was always kind of odd to see because like, you know, yeah, I could see everything that I needed to see in one picture, but like you'd almost need like an eye tracker to know what I was looking at. So yeah. Oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad that that was helpful. Um, yeah, and you really don't want to, uh, it's called fixating on an instrument or fixating on one thing. You really don't want to do that. Um, like I said, the you know two most important things in aviation are the next two things. So always thinking about, okay, what is it that I'm going to be doing next year? Uh, all right, let me go back and actually flip through oops, the rest of the completion standards for today. So there's essentially two sets of completion standards. Oops, I'll pull this around so my audio is a little better. A uh, client must demonstrate proficiency at planning and flying traffic pattern approaches at towered, non-towered airports. I'm going to update that. Originally, this lesson plan was for towered and non-towered, and instead I pulled non-towered out and made it um, towered airports. And I pulled non-towered out, and I'm, we're going to talk about that in a future dedicated lesson, because I think for where we are in training, we really can focus on the Palo Alto traffic patterns. Talking about a non-towered airport's traffic patterns uh, will be a really seamless transition. Comply with AIM recommended procedures. Maintain awareness of and proper spacing from other aircraft. Maintain aircraft pattern altitude plus or minus 1,000 feet and airspeed plus or minus 10 knots or miles per hour. For go-arounds, apply takeoff power immediately and transition to climb pitch attitude for VY or VX as appropriate plus or minus uh, plus 10 minus 5 knots. For required homework here, memorize the power settings and airspeeds for the pattern. This is really useful. We're using it every time. Um, oops, I left this in from the other one. This is going to be... Um, <laughs> so part of the reason I pulled out non-towered airports is I also pulled out um, some of the stuff we're going to talk about with landings um, because it would have been two or two and a half hours of ground, and then we would have had no ground tomorrow. And I was kind of like, well, we might as well... Like we can, we can have a ground session tomorrow. We don't need to make it just flying. So, um, okay. So that's a good recommendation. And then you want to read the chart supplement for, um, Palo Alto airport. The first time you read through a chart supplement, you'll want to have the table of, or the, um, explanation at the beginning of the chart supplement, um, booklet alongside the chart supplement you're actually looking at. And it will just take a while to go through line by line to understand what's happening. Um, Ask yourself lots of questions. What does this mean? Um, how would I apply this? Why would I want to know that kind of information? Um, some of it is things that wouldn't necessarily matter to us as VFR pilots. Things like if they have a hook for landing uh, jets, 
that kind of thing. Um, but you should still know what the line means to know that it doesn't apply to you. Recommended homework, chair fly the air traffic or the traffic pattern. So think about that left and right patterns. You can think about Palo Alto in particular with that 10 degree deviation. Um, and then practice the, the names of the different legs for the pattern. Uh, that's one o'clock. So thanks everyone for tuning in. Tomorrow we'll do uh, landings, normal and crosswind. And of course, we'll do some more practice around the traffic pattern uh, at that point. Uh, so thanks everyone. And shoots, if you wanted to ask your question, you're more than welcome to. If it's, um, if it's something that would help with the learning, I'd be happy to answer it. If it's something that's just sort of uh, will, would be fun to know, but is fine to wait till the non-towered section, then we'll talk about that in, um, I think it's like five lessons or so. I can even look. Um, not what I wanted. Let's see. You'll talk about it at lesson 13, and we're on lesson eight, so in like five. Okay, sounds good. Um, great. Well, then I will see you all tomorrow. Have a good Tuesday.